Dickens and Christmas In the July of 1844, Dickens went on an Italian tour, which he afterwards summarized in the book called Pictures from Italy. They are, of course, very vivacious, but there is no great need to insist on them considered as Italian sketches. There is no need whatever to worry about them as a phase in the mind of Dickens when he traveled out of England. He never traveled out of England. There is no trace in all these amusing pages that he really felt the great foreign things which lie in wait for us in the south of Europe. The Latin civilization, the Catholic Church, the art of the center, the endless end of Rome. His travels are not travels in Italy, but travels in Dickens' land. He sees amusing things, he describes them amusingly. But he would have seen things just as good in a street in Pimlico, and described them just as well. Few things were racier, even in his raciest novel, than his description of the marionette play of the death of Napoleon. Nothing could be more perfect than the figure of the doctor, which had something wrong with its wires, and hence hovered above the couch, and delivered medical opinions in the air. Nothing could be better as catching of the spirit of all popular drama than the colossal depravity of the wooden image of Sir Eudston Lowe. But there is nothing Italian about it. Dickens would have made just as good fun, indeed just the same fun, of a Punch and Judy show, performing in Long Acre or in Lincoln's Inn Fields. Dickens uttered just and sincere satire on a Plornish and a Podsnap, but Dickens was as English as any Podsnap or any Plornish. He had a hearty humanitarianism and a hearty sense of justice to all nations, so far as he understood it. But that very kind of humanitarianism, that very kind of justice, were English. He was the Englishman of the type that made free trade the most English of all things, since it was at once calculating and optimistic. He respected catacombs and gondolas, but that very respect was English. He wondered at brigands and volcanoes, but that very wonder was English. The very conception that Italy consists of these things was an English conception. The root of things he never understood the Roman legend, the ancient life of the Mediterranean, the world-old civilization of the vine and olive, the mystery of the immutable church. He never understood these things, and I am glad to say he never understood them. He could only have understood them by ceasing to be the inspired cockney that he was, the rousing English radical of the great radical age in England. That spirit of his was one of the things that we have had which were truly national. All other forces we have borrowed, especially those which flatter us most. Imperialism is foreign, socialism is foreign, militarism is foreign, education is foreign, strictly even liberalism is foreign. But radicalism was our own, as English as the hedgerows. Dickens abroad, then, was, for all serious purposes, simply the Englishman abroad. The Englishman, man abroad, is, for all serious purposes, simply the Englishman at home. Of this generalization, one modification must be made. Dickens did feel a direct pleasure in the bright and busy exterior of the French life. The clean caps, the colored uniforms, the skies like blue enamel, the little green trees, the little white houses, the scene picked out in primary colors like a child's picture book. This he felt, and this he put, by a stroke of genius, into the mouth of Mrs. Lirriper, a London landlady on a holiday. For Dickens always knew that it is the simple, and not the subtle, who feel differences, and he saw all his colors through the clear eyes of the poor. And in thus taking to his heart the streets, as it were, rather than the spires of the continent, he showed beyond question that combination of which we have spoken. For it is for the sake of the streets and shops and the coats and the hats that we should go abroad. They are far better worth going to see than the castles and cathedrals and Roman camps. For the wonders of the world are the same 
all over the world, at least all over the European world. Castles that throw valleys in the shadow, ministers that strike the sky, roads so old that they seem to have been made by the gods, these are all Christian countries. The marvels of man are at all our doors. A laborer hoeing turnips in Sussex has no need to be ignorant that the bones of Europe are the Roman roads. A clerk living in Lambeth has no need not to know that there was a Christian art exuberant in the thirteenth century, for only across the river he can see the live stones of the Middle Ages surging together towards the stars. But exactly the things that do strike the traveller as extraordinary are the ordinary things, the food, the clothes, the vehicles. The strange things are cosmopolitan, the common things are national and peculiar. Cologne spire is lifted on the same arches as Canterbury, but the thing you cannot see out of Germany is a German beer garden. There is no need for a Frenchman to go look at Westminster Abbey as a piece of English architecture. It is not, in the special sense, a piece of English architecture. But a handsome cab is a piece of English architecture, a thing produced by the peculiar poetry of our cities, the symbol of a certain reckless comfort which is really English, a thing to draw a pilgrimage of the nations. The imaginative Englishman will be found all day in a café, the imaginative Frenchman in a handsome cab. This sort of pleasure Dickens took in the Latin life, but no deeper kind, and the strongest of all possible indications of his fundamental detachment from it can be found in one fact. A great part of the time that he was in Italy, he was engaged in writing the chimes, and such Christmas tales, tales of Christmas in the English towns, tales full of fog and snow and hail and happiness. Dickens could find in any street divergences between man and man, deeper than the divisions of nations. His fault was to exaggerate differences. He could find types almost as distinct as separate tribes of animals in his own brain and his own city, those two homes of a magnificent chaos. The only two southerners introduced prominently into his novels, the two in Little Dorrit, are popular English foreigners. I had almost said stage foreigners. Villainy is, in English eyes, a southern trait. Therefore, one of the foreigners is villainous. Vivacity is, in English eyes, another southern trait. Therefore, the other foreigner is vivacious. But we can see from the outlines of both that Dickens did not have to go to Italy to get them. While poor panting millionaires, poor tired earls, and poor God-forsaken American men of culture are plotting about in Italy for literary inspiration. Charles Dickens made up the whole of that Italian romance, as I strongly suspect, from the faces of two London organ grinders. In the sunlight of the southern world, he was still dreaming of the firelight of the north. Among the palaces and the white campanelli, he shut his eyes to see Marleybone, and dreamed a lovely dream of chimney-pots. He was not happy, he said, without streets. The very foulness and smoke of London were lovable in his eyes, and fill his Christmas tales with the vivid vapor. In the clear skies of the south he saw afar off the fog of London, like a sunset cloud, and longed to be in the core of it. This Christmas tone of Dickens, in connection with his travels, is a matter that can only be expressed by a parallel with one of his other works. Much the same that has here been said of his pictures from Italy may be said about his child's history of England. But the difference that, while the pictures from Italy do in a sense add to his fame, the history of England is almost every sense detracts from it. But the nature of the limitation is the same. What Dickens was, traveling in distant lands, that he was traveling in distant ages, a sturdy, sentimental English radical, with a large heart and a narrow mind. He could not help falling into that besetting sin or weakness of the modern progressive, the habit of regarding the contemporary questions as the eternal questions, and the latest word as the last. He could not get out of his head the instinctive conception 
that the real problem before St. Dunstan was whether he should support Lord John Russell or Sir Robert Peel. He could not help seeing the remotest peaks lit up by the raging bonfire of his own passionate political crisis. He lived for the instant and its urgency. That is, he did what St. Dunstan did. He lived in an eternal present like all simple men. It is indeed a child's history of England, but the child is the writer and not the reader. But Dickens, in his cheapest cockney utilitarianism, was not only English, but unconsciously historic. Upon him descended the real tradition of Merry England, and not upon the pallid medievalists who thought they were reviving it. The pre-Raphaelites, the Gothicists, the admirers of Middle Ages, had in their subtlety and sadness the spirit of the present day. Dickens had in his buffoonery and bravery the spirit of the Middle Ages. He was much more medieval in his attacks on medievalism than they were in their defenses of it. It was he who had the things of Chaucer, the love of large jokes and long stories and brown ale, and all the white roads of England. Like Chaucer, he loved story within story, every man telling a tale. Like Chaucer, he saw something openly comic in men's motley trades. Sam Weller would have been a great gain to the Canterbury pilgrimage, and told an admirable story. Rossetti's Damoiselle would have been a great bore, regarded as too fast by the prioress and too priggish by the wife of Bath. It is said that in the somewhat sickly Victorian revival of feudalism, which was called Young England, a nobleman hired a hermit to live in his grounds. It is also said that the hermit struck for more beer. Whether this anecdote be true or not, it is always told as showing a collapse from the ideal of the Middle Ages to the level of the present day. But in the mere act of striking for beer, the holy man was much more medieval than the fool who employed him. It would be hard to find a better example of this than Dickens' great defense of Christmas. In fighting for Christmas, he was fighting for the old European festival, pagan and Christian, for that trinity of eating, drinking, and praying, which to moderns appears irreverent, for the holy day which is really a holiday. He had himself the most babyish ideas about the past. He supposed the Middle Ages to have consisted of tournaments and torture chambers. He supposed himself to be a brisk man of the manufacturing age, almost a utilitarian. But for all that, he defended the medieval feast, which was going out, against the utilitarianism, which was coming in. He could only see all that was bad in medievalism, but he fought for all that was good in it. And he was all the more really in sympathy with the old strength and simplicity, because he only knew that it was good, and did not know that it was old. He cared as little for medievalism as the medievalists did. He cared as much as they did for lustiness and virile laughter, and sad tales of good lovers, and pleasant tales of good livers. He would have been very much bored by Ruskin and Walter Pater, if they had explained to him the strange sunset tints of Lippi and Botticelli. He had no pleasure in looking on the dying Middle Ages, but he looked on the living Middle Ages, on a piece of the old uproarious superstition, still unbroken, and he hailed it like a new religion. The Dickens character ate pudding to an extent at which the modern medievalists turned pale. They would do every kind of honor to an old observance, except observing it. They would pay to a church feast every sort of compliment, except feasting. And, as I have said, as were his unconscious relations to our European past, so were his unconscious relations to England. He imagined himself to be, if anything, a sort of cosmopolitan, at any rate, to be a champion of the charms and merits of continental lands against the arrogance of our island. But he was, in truth, very much more a champion of the old and genuine England against that comparatively cosmopolitan England which we have all lived to see. And here again, the supreme example is Christmas. Christmas is, as I have said, one of numberless old European feasts, of which the essence is the combination of religion with merry-making. But among those feasts, 
It is also especially and distinctively English in the style of its merrymaking, and even in the style of its religion. For the character of Christmas, as distinct, for instance, from the continental Easter, lies chiefly in two things. First, on the terrestrial side, the note of comfort rather than the note of brightness, and on the spiritual side, Christian charity rather than Christian ecstasy. And comfort is, like charity, a very English instinct. Nay, comfort is, like charity, an English merit. Though our comfort may and does degenerate into materialism, just as our charity may and does degenerate into laxity and make-believe. This ideal of comfort belongs peculiarly to England. It belongs peculiarly to Christmas. Above all, it belongs preeminently to Dickens, and it is astonishingly misunderstood. It is misunderstood by the continent of Europe. It is, if possible, still more misunderstood by the English of today. On the continent, the restauranters provide us with raw beef as if we were savages. Yet old English cooking takes as much care as French. And in England has arisen a parvenu patronism, which represents the English as everything but English as a blend of Chinese stoicism, Latin militarism, Prussian rigidity, and American bad taste. And so England, whose fault is gentility and whose virtue is geniality, England, with her tradition of the great gay gentleman of Elizabeth, is represented to the four quarters of the world, as in Mr. Kipling's religious poems, in the enormous image of a solemn cad. And because it is very difficult to be comfortable in the suburbs, the suburbs have voted that comfort is a gross and material thing. Comfort, especially this vision of Christmas comfort, is the reverse of a gross material thing. It is far more poetical, properly speaking, than the Garden of Epicurus. It is far more artistic than the Palace of Art. It is more artistic because it is based upon a contrast a contrast between the fire and wine within the house and the winter and the roaring rains without. It is far more poetical, because there is in it a note of defense, almost of war, a note of being besieged by the snow and hail, of making merry in the belly of a fort. The man who said that an Englishman's house is his castle said much more than he meant. The Englishman thinks of his house as something fortified and provisioned, and his very surliness is at root romantic. And this sense would naturally be strongest in wild winter nights, when the lowered portcullis and the lifted drawbridge do not merely bar people out, but bar people in. The Englishman's house is most sacred, not merely when the king cannot enter it, but when the Englishman cannot get out of it. This comfort, then, is an abstract thing, a principle. The English poor shut all their doors and windows till their rooms reek like the black hole. They are suffering for an idea. Mere animal hedonism would not dream, as we English do, of winter feasts and little rooms, but of eating fruit in large and idle gardens. Mere sensuality would desire to please all its senses. But to our good dreams this dark and dangerous background is essential. The highest pleasure we can imagine is a defiant pleasure, a happiness that stands at bay. The word comfort is not indeed the right word. It conveys too much of the slander of mere sense. The true word is coziness, a word not translatable. One at least of the essentials of it is smallness, smallness in preference to largeness, smallness for smallness sake. The merrymaker wants a pleasant parlor. He would not give two pence for a pleasant continent. In our difficult time, of course, a fight for mere space has become necessary. Instead of being greedy for ale and a Christmas pudding, we are greedy for mere air, an equally essential appetite. In abnormal conditions this is wise, and the illimitable veldt is an excellent thing for nervous people. But our fathers were large and healthy enough to make a thing humane and not worry about whether it was hygienic. They were big enough to get into small rooms. 
Of this quite deliberate and artistic quality in the close Christmas chamber, the standing evidence is Dickens in Italy. He created these dim firelit tales like little dim red jewels, as an artistic necessity in the center of an endless summer. Amid the white cities of Tuscany, he hungered for something romantic and wrote about a rainy Christmas. Amid the pictures of the Uffizi, he starved for something beautiful and fed his memory on London fog. His feeling for the fog was especially poignant and typical. In the first of his Christmas tales, the popular Christmas carol, he suggested the very soul of it in one simile when he spoke of the dense air, suggesting that nature was brewing on a large scale. This sense of the thick atmosphere as something to eat or drink, something not only solid but satisfactory, may seem almost insane. But it is no exaggeration of Dickens' emotion. We speak of a fog that you cut with a knife. Dickens would have liked the phrase as suggesting that the fog was a colossal cake. He liked even more his own phrase of the titanic brewery, and no dream would have given him a wilder pleasure than to grope his way to some such tremendous vats and drink the ale of the giants. There is a current prejudice against fogs, and Dickens perhaps is their only poet. Considered hygienically, no doubt, this may be more or less excusable. But considered poetically, fog is not undeserving. It has a real significance. We have in our great cities abolished the clean and sane darkness of the country. We have outlawed night and sent her wandering in wild meadows. We have lit eternal watchfires against her return. We have made a new cosmos, and as a consequence, our own sun and stars. And as a consequence also, and most justly, we have made our own darkness. Just as every lamp is a warm human moon, so every fog is a rich human nightfall. If it were not for this mystic accident, we should never see darkness, and he who has never seen darkness has never seen the sun. Fog for us is the chief form of that outward pressure which compresses mere luxury into real comfort. It makes the world small, in the same spirit, in that common and happy cry that the world is small, meaning that it is full of friends. The first man that emerges out of the mist with a light is for us Prometheus, a savior bringing fire to men. He is that greatest and best of all men, greater than the heroes, better than the saints, Man Friday. Every rumble of a cart, every cry in the distance, marks the heart of humanity beating, undaunted in the darkness. It is wholly human, man toiling in his own cloud. If real darkness is like the embrace of God, this is the dark embrace of man. In such a sacred cloud the tale called The Christmas Carol begins, the first and most typical of all his Christmas tales. It is not irrelevant to dilate upon the geniality of this darkness, because it is characteristic of Dickens that his atmospheres are more important than his stories. The Christmas atmosphere is more important than Scrooge, or the ghosts either. In a sense, the background is more important than the figures. The same thing may be noticed in his dealings with that other atmosphere, beside that of good humor, which he excelled in creating an atmosphere of mystery and wrong, such as that which he gathers round Mrs. Clennam, rigid in her chair, or old Miss Havisham, ironically robed as a bride. Here again the atmosphere altogether eclipses the story, which often seems disappointing in comparison. The secrecy is sensational. The secret is tame. The surface of the thing seems more awful than the core of it. It seems almost as if these grisly figures, Mrs. Shadband and Mrs. Clennam, Miss Havisham and Miss Flight, Nemo and Sally Brass, were keeping something back from the author, as well as from the reader. When the book closes, we do not know their real secret. They soothe the optimistic Dickens with something less terrible than the truth. The dark house of Arthur Clennam's childhood really depresses us. It is a true glimpse into that quiet street in hell where lived the children of that unique dispensation which theologians call Calvinism and Christians devil worship. But some stranger crime had really been done there, some more monstrous blasphemy or human sacrifice than the suppression of some silly document 
advantageous to the silly Dorrits. Something worse than a common tale of jilting lay behind the masquerade and madness of the awful Miss Havisham. Something worse was whispered by the misshapen Quilp to the sinister Sally in that wild, wet summer house by the river. Something worse than the clumsy plot against the clumsy kit. These dark pictures seemed almost as if they were literally visions, things, that is, that Dickens saw, but did not understand. And as with his backgrounds of gloom, so with his backgrounds of goodwill, in such tales as The Christmas Carol. The tone of the tale is kept throughout in a happy monotony, though the tale is everywhere irregular and in some places weak. It has the same kind of artistic unity that belongs to a dream. A dream may begin with the end of the world and end with a tea party, but either the end of the world will end as a trivial as a tea party, or that tea party will be as terrible as the day of doom. The incidents change wildly. The story scarcely changes at all. The Christmas Carol is a kind of philanthropic dream, an enjoyable nightmare, in which the scenes shift bewilderingly and seem as miscellaneous as the pictures in a scrapbook, but in which there is one constant state of the soul, a state of rowdy benediction and a hunger for human faces. The beginning is about a winter day and a miser, yet the beginning is in no way bleak. The author starts with a kind of happy howl. He bangs on our door like a drunken carol singer. His style is festive and popular. He compares the snow and hail to philanthropists who come down handsomely. He compares the fog to unlimited beer. Scrooge is not really inhuman at the beginning any more than he is at the end. There is a hardiness in his inhospitable sentiments that is akin to humor and therefore to humanity. He is only a crusty old bachelor, and had, I strongly suspect, given away Turkey secretly all his life. The beauty and the real blessing of the story do not lie in the mechanical plot of it. The repentance of Scrooge, probable or improbable, they lie in the great furnace of real happiness that glows through Scrooge and everything around him, that great furnace, the heart of Dickens. Whether the Christmas visions would or would not convert Scrooge, they convert us. Whether or no the visions were evoked by real spirits of the past, present, and future, they were evoked by that truly exalted order of angels who are correctly called high spirits. They are impelled and sustained by a quality which our contemporary artists ignore or almost deny, but which in a life decently lived, as in normal and attainable as sleep, a positive, passionate, conscious joy. The story sings from end to end like a happy man going home, and like a happy and good man, when it cannot sing, it yells. It is lyric and exclamatory from the first exclamatory words of it. It is strictly a Christmas carol. Dickens, has been said, went illy with this kindly cloud still about him, still meditating on Yule mysteries. Among the olives and the orange trees, he wrote his second great Christmas tale, The Chimes, at Genoa in 1844 a Christmas tale only differing from the Christmas carol, in being fuller of the grey rains of winter in the north. The chimes is like the carol, an appeal for charity and mirth, but it is a stern and fighting appeal. If the other is a Christmas carol, then this is a Christmas war song. In it Dickens hurled himself, with even more than his usual militant joy and scorn, into an attack upon a cant, which he said made his blood boil. This cant was nothing more nor less than the whole tone taken by three-quarters of the political and economic world towards the poor. It was a vague and vulgar Benthamism, with a rollicking Tory touch in it. It explained to the poor their duties, with a cold and coarse philanthropy unendurable by any free man. It had also at its command a kind of brutal banter, a loud good humor which Dickens sketches savagely in Alderman Cute. He felt furiously on all their ideas, the cheap advice to live cheaply, the base advice to live basely, above all the preposterous primary assumption that the rich are to advise the poor, and not the poor the rich. There were and are hundreds of these benevolent bullies. Some say that the poor should give up having children, which means that they should give up their great virtue of sexual sanity. 
Some say that they should give up treating each other, which means that they should give up all that remains to them of the virtue of hospitality. Against all of this, Dickens thundered very thoroughly in the chimes. It may be remarked in passing that this affords another instance of a confusion already referred to, the confusion whereby Dickens supposed himself to be exalting the present over the past, whereas he was really dealing deadly blows at things strictly peculiar to the present. Embedded in this book is a somewhat useless interview between Trotty Veck and the church bells in which the latter lecture the former for having supposed, why I don't know, that they were expressing regret for the disappearance of the Middle Ages. There is no reason why Trotty Veck or anyone else should idealize the Middle Ages. But certainly he was the last man in the world to be asked to idealize the 19th century, seeing that the smug and stingy philosophy which poisons his life throughout the book was an exclusive creation of that century. But as I have said before, the fieriest medievalist may forgive Dickens for disliking the good things the Middle Ages took away, considering how he loved whatever good things the Middle Ages left behind. It matters very little that he hated old feudal castles when they were already old. It matters very much that he hated the new poor law while it was still new. The moral of this matter in the chimes is essential. Dickens had sympathy with the poor in the Greek and literal sense. He suffered with them mentally, for the things that irritated them were the things that irritated him. He did not pity the people, or even champion the people, or even merely love the people. In this matter, he was the people. He alone in our literature is the voice not merely of the social substratum, but even of the subconsciousness of the substratum. He utters the secret anger of the humble. He says what the uneducated only think, or even only feel, about the educated. And in nothing is he so genuinely such a voice as in this fact of his fiercest mood being reserved for methods that are counted scientific and progressive. Pure and exalted atheists talk themselves into believing that the working classes are turning with indignant scorn from the churches. The working classes are not indignant against the churches in the least. The things the working classes really are indignant against are the hospitals. The people has no definite disbelief in the temples of theology. The people has a fiery and practical disbelief in the temples of physical science. The things the poor hate are the modern things, the rationalistic things. Doctors, inspectors, poor law guardians, professional philanthropy. They never showed any reluctance to be helped by the old and corrupt monasteries. They will often die rather than be helped by the modern and efficient workhouse. Of all this anger, good or bad, Dickens is the voice of an accusing energy. When in The Christmas Carol Scrooge refers to the surplus population, the spirit tells him very justly not to speak until he knows what the surplus is and where it is. The implication is severe but sound. When a group of superciliously benevolent economists look down into the abyss for the surplus population, assuredly there is only one answer that should be given to them, and that is to say, if there is a surplus, you are a surplus, and if anyone were ever cut off, they would be. If the barricades went up in our streets and the poor became masters, I think the priests would escape. I fear the gentlemen would but I believe the gutters would be simply running with the blood of philanthropists. Lastly, he was at one with the poor in this chief matter of Christmas, in the matter that is a special festivity. There is nothing on which the poor are more criticized than on the point of spending large sums on small feasts, and though there are material difficulties, there is nothing in which they are more right. It is said that a Boston paradox monger said, Give us the luxuries of life, and we will dispense with the necessities. But it is the whole human race that says it, from the first savage wearing feathers instead of clothes, to the last costermonger having a treat instead of three meals. The third of his Christmas stories, The Cricket on the Hearth, calls for no extensive comment, though it is very characteristic. It has all the qualities which we call dominant qualities in his Christmas sentiment. It has coziness, that is comfort, 
that depends upon a discomfort surrounding it, that has a sympathy with the poor, and especially with the extravagance of the poor, with what may be called the temporary wealth of the poor. It has the sentiment of the hearth, that is, the sentiment of the open fire being the red heart of the room. That open fire is a veritable flame of England, still kept burning in the midst of a mean civilization of stoves. But everything that is valuable in the cricket on the hearth is perhaps as well expressed in the title as it is in the story. The tale itself, in spite of some of those inimitable things that Dickens never failed to say, is a little too comfortable to be quite convincing. The Christmas Carol is the conversion of an anti-Christmas character. The Chimes is a slaughter of anti-Christmas characters. The Cricket perhaps fails for lack of this crusading note. For everything has its weak side, and when full justice has been done to this neglected note of poetic comfort, we must remember that it has its very real weak side. The defect of it in the work of Dickens was that he tended sometimes to pile up the cushions till none of the characters could move. He is so much interested in effecting his state of static happiness that he forgets to make a story at all. His princes, at the start of the story, begin to live happily ever afterwards. We feel this strongly in Master Humphrey's clock, and we feel it sometimes in these Christmas stories. He makes his characters so comfortable that his characters begin to dream and drivel, and he makes his reader so comfortable that his reader goes to sleep. The actual tale of the carrier and his wife sounds somewhat sleepily in our ears. We cannot keep our attention fixed on it, though we are conscious of a kind of warmth from it, as from a great wood fire. We know so well that everything will soon be all right, that we do not suspect what the carrier suspects, and are not frightened when the gruff Tackleton growls. The sound of the festivities at the end come fainter on our ears than did the shout of the Cratchits or the bells of Trotty Vec. All the good figures that followed Scrooge when he came growling out of the fog fade into the fog again. End of chapter 7